Morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I will be hanging out with you today. Today, the topic of discussion is population growth models. We're going to look at what level of support is possible within a population. And before we even get going, I'm just going to ask your forgiveness. I'm in the middle of getting over a cold, so I'm a little bit snorty and snuffly. So sorry about that. But here's your objectives for the day. <clears throat> By the end of this video, there are three things you should know or be able to do. First of all, compare and contrast population growth models. Second, discuss conditions that can impact the growth of a population and explain the difference between K and R selected species. So that's what we need to talk about. Let's go ahead and get going. So there are different models, and by model I mean like a mathematical model that describes the growth of a population. Mathematical models are basically used to show what the population of a group of organisms is going to be at any given point in time. First model that you need to be aware of is the exponential model, and it is known as the R model because it's based on how quickly an organism can reproduce. That rate at which an organism can naturally reproduce is known as the R or intrinsic growth rate. Intrinsic growth rate is <clears throat> essentially what an animal can do if it has no predators. In an exponential model, you are working under ideal conditions, and you can see over here on the right a graph of what the population would look like. Your population would start out slow, but as kids begin to have kids, begin to have kids, you see a situation where the population just takes off and it makes this J-shaped curve. You can kind of think of it like this. One organism has two. Each of those two has two. Each of those two has two. And soon enough, I don't have enough screen for all of the babies that are being born. So recognize this as an exponential curve. Know that it is based on the intrinsic growth of an organism, meaning the absolute rate at which an organism can reproduce, and that this occurs under absolutely ideal environmental conditions. The second growth model, and this is probably the more realistic growth model, is called the logistic model or the K model because it is based on the carrying capacity of an environment. Now, remember that carrying capacity is the maximum number of organisms that an environment has the resources to sustain. <clears throat> that is represented as K. Carrying capacity is known as K. So in the logistic model, what we see happening is we've got a population that actually takes off and it starts to go through an exponential growth phase and then as it gets close to the carrying capacity of the environment the growth of the population levels out so organisms start having fewer kids more of them are dying off and essentially an equilibrium is reached where the population kind of hits up against this carrying capacity and says all right well we're out of resources so we can't grow any bigger than this so recognize this as a logistic curve know that it's based on carrying capacity which is represented as K <clears throat> Now, there are variations to the logistic model because not every population, actually very few populations, will just kind of get up and ride along that carrying capacity and just stay there. So one situation that is fairly common is called overshoot and die-off. And this is where a set up a graph here. So let's say here's our carrying capacity. Our population will take off in exponential growth it will surpass whatever the carrying capacity is, and the carrying capacity is going to be based on some limiting factor. So let's say that this limiting factor is the availability of water. Our population overshoots that. Suddenly there's not enough water to support all of our organisms, so your population crashes, and that would be the die-off. And then it rebounds, and from there on out, it's just going to kind of bounce back and forth right along this carrying capacity where it will overshoot it, and then because there's no, not enough resources, it will die off and grow back and die off and grow back. So know that that is known as overshoot and die off, and it's basically what keeps a population near that carrying capacity, and this is more of what we see in the real world. Another variation on the logistic model is the representation of a predator-prey relationship, and the graph on the right shows the population of snowshoe hare and its predator, the Canadian lynx, over a long period of time. And what research has found is that and it would make sense that these populations go together. You know, the Canadian lynx preys on the hare. So <clears throat> when there's a whole bunch of hare available, then the lynx can have a lot of kids because it has an ample food supply. But once there become too many lynx, they kill off all the snowshoe hares. And then once all the snowshoe hares are gone, there's not enough food for the lynx. So both populations decline together. Usually the prey population 
is the one that drives the growth and decline of the predator population because you need to have the food source first before your predator population can grow. So growth in the hare population, then growth in the predator population, decline in the prey population, decline in the predator population. All right, let's talk about our two different types of species. You've got case-selected species and our selected species. Case-selected species, here are the things to know about it. These are organisms <clears throat> that reproduce very slowly. They give a lot of care to their young. They put a lot of investment into raising just a few kids in their lifetime. And they reproduce slowly until their population reaches the carrying capacity, which is K. And that's why they're known as a K-selected species, is because they actually have regard for the carrying capacity of an environment. And like I said, just to recap, reproduce slowly, good care for the young, usually larger animals. Um, good examples, elephants, humans, whales, dogs, things like that. Our selected species is the opposite. You ever heard the term reproducing like rabbits? That is an our selected species. Our selected species, remember R stands for intrinsic growth rate, which is the maximum rate at which an organism can reproduce. Our selected species have zero regard for carrying capacity. They make as many babies as they can, they reproduce as quickly as they can, and obviously they usually overshoot carrying capacity and then experience a die-off. Organisms that are R selected are usually smaller organisms that reproduce often and in high numbers. So frogs, rabbits, insects, things like that, that can reproduce quickly and have a lot of kids. <clears throat> so R and K selected species can be plotted on a survivorship curve. And a survivorship curve, this blurry graph you got in front of you, basically talks about what percentage of the population is going to be alive at a given point in their lifespan. So you got three different curves you can have. First one would be the top curve. This would be for a K-selected species. So if you look at a K-selected species, most of the offspring survive their childhood. And as you go through percentage of life, so this is percentage of maximum lifespan, most of them will make it towards their maximum lifespan. And then there's a very sharp die-off at the end. Okay. Opposite of this is an R-selected species where they have a ton of babies that die off very rapidly and then the remainder kind of live out the rest of their lives. So in a K-selected species, a lot of the kids live and make it to their maximum lifespan. <clears throat> in an R-selected species, huge die off to start and then those that survive carry on to reproduce. In the middle, type 2 curve is an organism that shows a pretty even rate of decline over life. So it's not like a bunch live and then die off at the end or a bunch die off first and then a few live to the end. This is pretty much spread out over time. So K-selected, R-selected, and there's just various organisms. Squirrels are an example that exhibit a type 2 survivorship curve. The last thing I want to talk about is a metapopulation. <clears throat> metapopulation is actually a group of populations with connected habitats. And the reason we want to talk about them a little bit is Metapopulations show greater resilience than individual populations. Let me try a little diagram. So let's say we've got a series of mountain ranges, and in these mountain ranges live cougars. So let's say here's cougar population one, and two, and three, and four. Now, <clears throat> each of these populations are their own individual population, meaning they have their own unique characteristics, but there are corridors that allow these cougars to travel between the different populations. So obviously that provides opportunity for mixing of genes between these different populations. Now, if these were isolated from each other, they couldn't move back and forth, any number of disasters could cause one of the communities to die off. And because, you know, there may not be as much genetic variability there, you know, a die off is much more likely. Now, if you've got a situation where these organisms are able to move and to mix between populations. They can shuffle their genes all over the place, so a disease might come along and it might kill a couple individuals in one or two of the populations. But since there's a lot of different gene combinations around, they're more likely to survive. Also, this provides greater opportunity for mating and hunting. So just know that a metapopulation is a group of populations that are able to connect and interact and interbreed with one another. And that increases the resilience and the resistance of the population and their survival time. So I hope that was a helpful little overview of population models for you. Hopefully you got a little better grasp on how populations can grow and continue living. Thank you for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. Hopefully we'll see you again.